In this segment, we're going to look at the pre-CT general considerations, indications and limitations for the musculoskeletal system. So as with every other body area, we have to consider the general advantages and disadvantages of using CT. The advantages are many, but they have to be weighed up against the disadvantages in practice to make sure you make the right decision. And so there will often be a few questions you have to ask yourself before pr proceeding. Is CT appropriate for the anatomy I want to image? In this case, the musculoskeletal system. Will it hopefully answer the clinical question? Is it cost effective for the client? Are there any contraindications for me proceeding or are there any other appropriate imaging modalities I should consider first or more cost effective imaging modalities? Which body area or anatomic region should I scan with CT? And in the case of musculoskeletal ultrasound, um, CT, that may be multiple joints or multiple bones. And what type of acquisition do I need to perform and, and to make sure it's a success? So when do we choose the CT for the musculoskeletal system? Well, it's often indicated um, and we do use it routinely now for elbows, shoulders, and often for the carpi tarsi. And that may be a first line if we feel that there's an appropriate indication. Otherwise, it, we reserve it for complex or atypical orthopedic cases, perhaps chronic lameness of unknown cause and that hasn't got a diagnosis on routine radiographs. But there are many indications, and a lot of that revolves around joint diseases. There are many different types of joint disease that can be accurately characterized on CT. There may also be um, angular limb deformities. We use it for musculoskeletal neoplasia, both bone and soft tissue. In trauma cases where there may, may be complex fractures or fracture luxations, particularly of awkwardly shaped bones as well. It may be that something has been spotted that could be an aggressive bone lesion on radiographs and that we want to use CT to characterize this lesion or confirm an aggressive bone lesion plus stage the thorax. There may have been something seen on radiographs that wasn't, um, it was unsure whether it was significant or not, a subtle lesion. Um, and we might want to characterize or confirm that and whether that might be clinical, clinically significant by using CT. You may have apodicular swellings, um, or there may also be other lesions that are previously identified that you want to use CT for surgical planning. So what information do we need and what options do we have prior to choosing CT? Well, thorough physical exam is absolutely essential and it may be that you've identified masses or swellings that you can already sample for cytology or histology. And we have to add, it, add into the physical exam, the orthopedic examination, either conscious or under sedation, which may give us more information about localizing the localization of our lameness and therefore where to target with our imaging. And if you're unsure or you have further questions, it's always worth consulting an orthopaedic surgeon about what's the best route to, to pursue with your cases. Radiography will, main, will remain the first line imaging modality in a lot of musculoskeletal cases. It gives us a lot of information about the bones, but also about the surrounding soft tissues. And we also have musculoskeletal ultrasound as well, which can be used in certain cases, whether it be to assess swellings or to be or to assess ligamentous or tenderness structures around some of our joints of interest. So let's have a look at these routine radiographs of, a, of, a, of the canine elbow. We've got left and right elbow, both in neutral, lateral and craniocaudal positions. We get a good overall assessment of the joint um, and the bones, um, but there's a lot of superimposition of, of smaller bony structures that creates ambiguity. But we can appreciate that there's some periarticular new bone formation on the um, cranial radial head and anconeal process in both cases and some remodeling of the medial humeral condyle. Um, but there's, it's, it's difficult to assess the medial conoid process in any detail. And um, there may be some blunting and some slight heterogeneity, but we're unsure whether there's um, a, a fragment of the medial coronoid process there. So that's when CT comes into play. So we can we can reconstruct the CT. And in this case, we would use a bone window and we'd reconstruct the CT into different planes so that we can appreciate the joint in both sagittal, dorsal or axial imaging. And the sagittal gives us a good information about the congruency of the joint. But also as we move over to the medial coronoid process, we can see that it's hypo attenuating, blunted and remodeled. And we can start to assess it for any fragmentation that might be um, significant. And we can also see that there's a subtle hypo attenuating lesion there um, of the medial humeral condyle opposing the, the, me um, the medial coronoid process, which may be an evidence of some ki a kissing lesion or perhaps some osteochondrosis. So we can we're able to assess both the, the joint margins, the, the subchondral bone in a much greater level of detail from the CT. 
And if we look at consider those same regions on the axial CT, we can move to the medial coronoid process instantly and we can appreciate that there's some hypo attenuation um, and a sort of subtle line that runs across the apex there. There may be some micro fissuring, some malacia of the medial coronoid process or early in situ fragmentation, as well as um, assessing that periarticular new bone that's already already been um, appreciated in another plane. So what are the limitations of musculoskeletal CT? Well, there's not many. We have to be um, take care to try and optimize our resolution of our, our images. Um, and this can be limited by patient size, especially when we're considering small parts such as elbows, carpi, tarsi, for example. So this ultimately means we need to optimize this display field of view for our patients. So we need to make sure that size is right for the joint that we want to image and therefore the slice thickness and overlap have to be optimized for adequate joint imaging as well so that we can get good images that are diagnostic of our joints. Like with every other um, body region, soft tissue contrast resolution is limited. So that is particularly limited in soft tissue cases where there may be subtle soft tissue lesions that can be missed and MRI may be preferable in some cases. And therefore, the spine soft tissues within joints, imaging of those is limited. So menisci and the, ligament, the ligaments that surround joints as well. And it may be that we either have to add in CT arthrogra arthrography or maybe MRI as well to get better joint imaging. So what are the general acquisition considerations that we need to think about to make musculoskeletal CT a success? Well, a big principle is understanding display field of view. So once you've taken your acquisition, you want to reduce the reconstructed or display field of view around the bone, bone of joint of interest to increase our spatial resolution. Um, and this often as well, we need to think about removing bulky anatomy at the time of acquisition away from smaller joints to reduce any noise or streaking from scatter. And practically, this often involves turning the head and neck away from the elbows and, and carpi and, and manna so that the, the head and neck is outside of the, the scan plane. We want to try and make as where, where possible the, the um, limbs that we're imaging symmetrical so that we can um, review them uh, in comparison. And we want to try and keep the joints in a neutral position. We don't want to stress them or get any incongruency or, or distraction as a result of stressing those joints. Um, so if you want any more information about how to perform good musculoskeletal CT, then please review this VET-CT protocols for more detailed advice. Then we need to think about what are the common CT body area combinations that may arise. Um, and my, the majority of the time, this is because we're unable to localize our lameness adequately, but either due to patient compliance or whether they're stoic and not giving much away. But a common combination that we would perform would be shoulders and elbows together for an intermittent forelimb lameness or mild forelimb lameness. But other times we may add the carpi in as well. Um, it may be that if you have suspected shoulder or cervical pain, then you need to do the neck and shoulder together um, because we're because of the inability to localize where that pain is coming from. And otherwise, with hind limb lameness, it may be a combination of pelvis and hips or pelvis, hips and other joints of the hind limbs. Or we may also add the spine in as well because they could uh, um, uh, lesions of the spine could also cause a hind limb lameness. And it's worth considering and remembering that if you find a lesion that you that may be near plastic, for example, then you may want to image the thorax at the same time for staging. So thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions about musculoskeletal CT, then please get in contact with us at any time. Thank you.